Awesome. Well, happy Father's Day. Yeah, you're supposed to like reciprocate, right? Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Okay. Thanks. You guys are awesome. Good job. No, what a blessing it is, right? What a blessing it is for us to be here on Father's Day. And I actually, I commend all you fathers that are in here and really everyone, because I know you could be like out eating brunch right now or playing golf or doing something silly right like that, but you're here in church getting the word of God. So may God just bless us all. He says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So may we be rewarded in his word today. That's what we want to be rewarded in, right? In his word. Like the things of the world, those things are just passing away. But the things of his word will remain forever. And so would he fill us up with his word today? Yeah, amen. That's what we're going to be talking about. As a matter of fact, today, how God has given us these amazing scriptures to follow. And it is better for us to follow them than to chase after the things of the world. Because the things of the world are perishing. They're going to perish. So God doesn't want you to go down those roads. God wants you to follow him because he knows following him, everything that you do for him will remain forever, for all of eternity. So he says here in verse 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you that it does this right here. It makes us complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, thoroughly equipped to come out of the things of the world and come into the things of God, the things which remain forever. God, would you speak into our hearts right now? Would you re reward every person in this room right now that chose to be here today instead of going off and doing anything else, that chose to honor you today, chose to bless you today? Would you bless our hearts? Would you fill us with your spirit? And would you reveal your word to us? You say that the things of the Lord are spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned. Our own fleshly, physical man cannot know them unless you reveal them to us. So God, reveal yourself to us. Would this just be of you? Not of me, not of any other man, not of any other flesh. God, but just of you. Spirit to spirit, God. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've been discussing how the people of the world don't want the truth. They don't want to be made uncomfortable because that's what the truth does, doesn't it? The truth makes you a little uncomfortable. The truth forces change. You can't stay in the lie. You can't stay walking after a lie once you know the truth. That's why so many times people don't want the truth because they don't want to change. They want to stick in what they know. So instead of learning the word of God and finding the truth, they decide, no, I'd rather just stay in the lie that I already believe. It's a sad, sad state of existence because we know where it leads. It doesn't lead to everlasting life. It leads to everlasting death. It leads to everlasting separation from God. God wants to give you everlasting life. He does not want his children to be separated from him. Who wants their children to be separated from them? God is the same way. He desires that we would come to know him, that his spirit would come upon us and he would draw us in, that we can have eternal life with him forever, forever. 
it's worth trading everything of this life to have everything of that life. You know, it's so often we as Christians can look at other people who have more than us in the world and who's, who, who have things that are going good in their life. And we think, God, why is it this way? Why do all the people that aren't following you have so much? And me as a believer who is trying to follow you as best I can have so little. And so many bad things are going on in my life. I don't get it, God. And we can be resentful of what God is doing. But do you understand that God is a good father? Everybody know that? God is a good father. And God desires to give good gifts. And God knows that those who are perishing only have this life to look forward to. This life is as good as it will ever be for them. But for you, as a Christian, this life is as bad as it will ever be for you. Everything that happens to you here as a Christian, you have to understand, it's not going to get any worse than this. So everything you go through, all the trials and tribulations, all the hard things, things that God puts you through, he's doing that for a purpose. Number one, he's giving to people who aren't following him because he's a loving father. He knows that they're not going to have eternity with him. And so he's going to give to them now. Remember the story of the prodigal son? There was a father who had two sons. One son did what the father asked him and was obedient. The other son wasn't obedient. And he wanted to chase after the things of the world. So he went to his father and said, Father, give me my inheritance now. I know you haven't died yet, but I want my inheritance now because I want to go and chase after the things of the world. At first glance, this is not a good idea. Why? Because you know your son is going to get in trouble with that money. But the father, out of love for his son, gave him his inheritance. And the son took it and ran out and squandered it, lavish and wild living, until finally he ends up in utter poverty and he's feeding pigs, and he longed to eat the food that he was giving to the pigs. And finally, he comes to his senses and says, hmm, even my father's servants, my father's slaves, eat better than I do. Maybe I should go back and give myself as a slave to my father and be obedient to him. Amazing how that worked, huh? So he goes the whole time in his mind saying, I will just go back and be a slave to my father. But when he gets home, his father comes out and runs and hugs him and says, my son was dead, but now he is alive again. And he puts a robe on. Puts a ring on him. And even though the son said, I will just be your slave, he said, no, my son, my son. Our father is a good father. He cares for us. He knows what to give us in order to draw us to him. He doesn't want us to be an everlasting separation from him. He wants us to know him eternally. So everything you could give up in this life is worth it. Yeah. Everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Put it in perspective. Think about it in just this one way. In this life, you may get 100 years. You might. If you were chasing after the world, you'd be so excited to have 100 years here. But do you know that the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where he says we, as his saints, will rule and reign with him, is a thousand years. I have that verse. 
It's in Revelation 20, verse four. It says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. That's the saints. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. That's in the great tribulation. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Everybody say a thousand years. years. You might get a hundred years here, but you're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So how many of you would take all the bad things that God might want to give you in this hundred years and trade it for the thousand years of all good things that you're going to have then? That's just a thousand years. That's the start. That's where eternity begins. Yeah, you're going to have that thousand years, but then you're going to have all the rest of all eternity of good things with your good father who has prepared them for you. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You could clap for that. You have a good future in Jesus Christ. It's worth giving all this up. Don't look at the other people who are chasing after the things of the world and maybe getting it. Doesn't matter, that's all gonna perish. Everything that you're working for in this life is going to perish. Keep it in perspective. Keep it in priority. It's only the things that are done for Christ that will last. Everything else will disappear. What's worth it? What's worth it? God knows that there is no amount of lavish life that is worth your soul. What good does it do a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit a soul? It does you no good because it's all going to disappear. Your soul is what God cares about. That's what he's doing in your life. I understand that things aren't easy. I understand that as a Christian, you don't get everything you want. And that's hard because you're like, God, you said if I asked you, you'd give it to me. He's a loving father. He knows what to give you to draw you to him. That's what he wants to give you. Sometimes you can't be Jeff Bezos. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't have all the money you ever want. But God says, hey, it doesn't matter because you're going to have more than you could even imagine in heaven forever. More than you could even imagine. If Jeff Bezos doesn't come to know the Lord, you're going to have more than Jeff in heaven. Yeah. Let me talk to Jeff. It's true, though. You will. You will have more than him. It says in verse 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's so many people out there who aren't looking to follow the Lord. Even in the church, they're an imposter. They're just looking to deceive people. And the people are okay with it. And so when they say, oh, yeah, you need to give more money so that I could get this private jet. Do you think that's for you or for them? That's for them. They want to live their own lavish lifestyle, right? They want to chase after the things of the world. They want everything they could possibly have here. They don't care about people. You're just a number to them. How many butts are in the seats today? Let's take a count. What does that matter? If no one's going to heaven, who cares? 
But that's what they're about. It's just about the money. Look, I, I understand there's hypocrisy in the church, okay? Because I are one. But look, God wants to do something so much greater than that. God wants to use broken people in order to draw people to him. It's not about everything in this life. It's about the things of him. Don't be deceived by things that tickle your ears, things that appeal to your flesh. Those things don't matter. B came in this room today and she goes, hey, I'm blessed. And I say, you know, B, that means a lot coming from you. I hope you don't mind me sharing. I mean, B doesn't have a whole lot right now. But she came in and she said, you know, I'm blessed. And I said, B, you inspire me. Because you got so much less than I do. And you come in here saying, I'm blessed. And I come in here going, meh. Meh. God didn't do what I wanted him to do this week. We're so blessed in the Lord. We have so much. Yeah, you might be dead broke. You might be completely poor in this life. But even if you're poor in this life, you are rich because you have the kingdom of heaven coming to you. In verse 14, this is what he tells us. He says, don't be deceived. You must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. That's what the word does for us. It allows us to see the lies of the world and to not be deceived by them. You hear me say all the time, if you want to discern the lie, you have to know the truth. We love that word, right? Oh, you have the gift of discernment. I think you, I think you have the gift of discernment. Yeah, that's true. It is a gift from God. But you know, if you read the Bible, it says it's able to make one wise. It's able to make you see the lies that are out there, so that you don't fall into the same things. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I can't tell you how many times in life I've prayed that prayer. I've sat at a crossroads thinking, man, God, I don't know what to do. I'm in over my head. Look at me up here, pastor of this church. People look at me and go, you look like you're 12 years old. Like, what are you doing up here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, Lord, I'm in over my head here. It's got to be you. And that's what it is. It's got to be the spirit of God. He's the one who does that work. So here's two simple things. Write these things down. These are two simple things you can do to not be deceived by the world. You ever feel like the world's getting over on you? Like they're taking advantage of you? They're smarter than you are, and so they just steamroll you any chance they can? Here's two things. It's very simple. Here they are right here. Number one, what I've been preaching the whole time, you need to learn the word of God. Amen. Number one, the word he just said is able to make one wise. It's able to give you discernment. The God of the world who knows all the crazy woes that are out there wrote this down for his people that they could know him and get smarter. Wasn't that nice of him? That's number one. Number two, pray before you make decisions. Pray before you do things. God has given you a relationship with him that you could just say, oh God, please help me, and he hears you. How many times have I stood at a crossroads and been like, God, I don't know what to do here. 
I can go this way or I could go that way. And all of a sudden, the scripture will pop up in my mind. And I'm like, oh, he says not to do that and to do this. Thank you, God. I'm going to go this way. And all my friends that went that way got ensnared in something over there and took them years to get out of it. And I'm like, whoo. Thank you, God. Sticking to the word. And I've been there again and go, oh, Lord, I need help with this one. God, please give me wisdom. What do I do here? I don't know what to do. Please tell me. And he said, don't go that way. Go this way. I'm like, whew. same thing happened again. A bunch of people went that way, got all wrapped up in the craziness, and we were this way. We went around. Okay, thank you. I think Proverbs says that a wise man sees trouble from afar and goes around it. You don't see trouble from afar and go, oh, okay, let's just walk right through it. We'll be all right. No, he goes around it. Look, you, if you're going to pray and you're going to ask God for this wisdom, you better be prepared for what he's going to say. Because chances are, it's not going to be what you want. Let me preface. Okay? I'm not the preacher that told you what you wanted to hear today. I'm the preacher that told you what's going to happen. It's, you're going to pray to God and you're going to say, God, what should I do here? And he's going to tell you the opposite of what you wanted to do. God wants to see how much you trust him. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that prayer and it's been the most ridiculous thing. He said, go do this ridiculous thing. And I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea, God. Of all the ideas I had, that wasn't one of them. But it takes faith to walk with the Lord. And so I'm like, hey, all right, in faith, I'll just do it. And I've seen that the ridiculous thing he had me do actually worked out. And all the other ways didn't work out. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. You know, like when Peter met Jesus on the beach, and it says he came in from fishing all night long and caught zero. Everybody say zero. zero. He caught zero. He's cleaning his nets on the beach. And Jesus walks up to him and says, hey, push your boat back out there. Throw it off the other side. You saw Peter's initial reaction. He was like, Lord, I've been fishing all night long. All the way around this boat, every side. And I caught nothing. But what he said after that is what matters. He said, nevertheless... At your word, I'll do it. He pushes the boat back out, and you guys know what happened. There was more fish that could fill his boat. It started to sink. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to follow God. But when you follow him in faith, he will honor that, and he will take care of you. Know his word. Go back to that for me, would you? Know his word. And pray before you make decisions. And be prepared to do. I should add a third one. Be prepared to do what he tells you to do. It's not easy, but be prepared to do it. A couple years ago, my wife was bugging me about getting a pedal boat. You know what a pedal boat is? Where you sit and you <laughs> go across the lake. I didn't want one because I think those people look dumb doing it. <laughs> See, you like pedal boats? Okay. I look at those people and in my heart I go, idiots. I do. But because I'm trying to be a good husband and my wife wanted one, I'm like, fine. Like, I'll put my big tourist hat on and a bunch of sunscreen on my nose and we'll just, we'll go, okay? We'll do it. So I'm like, okay, let's look around for pedal boats. 
So we looked at like Bass Pro Shop and they could get up to like a thousand bucks. And I'm like, wait, I gotta pay to look like an idiot? <laughs> Normally you look like that, you get to do it for free, you know? They wanna put you on Facebook or something like that on a video. So I was like, okay, so I prayed about it. And the Lord said, no, wait. And I'm like, why? We have the money, we could get it. I'm already in too, I already said yes. So I gotta do it anyway. He said, no, wait. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll wait. A few months later, we're looking on Facebook. She sends me this thing, texts it over to me. Oh, look, I found a pedal boat, half price. I'm like, well, that works for me. It's better than what I was gonna pay, you know? Sure enough, we write the person, somebody already bought it out from under us. Secretly, I was like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, thank you, Lord. There is a God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Well, this past week, I'm driving home, and my wife calls me. She goes, guess what? I'm like, what? She goes, there's a pedal boat by our house for free. I'm like, oh, Lord. She's like, but it's too heavy. I can't put it in my car. I'm like, all right. So I'm praying the whole way there. Oh, God. Oh, Lord, help me. I made a deal with him. I said, okay, look, if it's still there, when I get there, I'll know that we're supposed to have this pedal boat. And secretly, I'm like, man, I hope somebody else gets there for me. I'm thinking all the scenarios through my head. I get there, come around the corner, and guess what? It was still there. I'm like, oh boy. So I'm like, okay, how else can I get out of this? So I start looking. I'm kicking the tires now. I'm lifting this thing up. I'm like, where's the cracks? I know this thing's got cracks in it. Nobody gives something away for free that's worth something, you know? I'm like, what's, what's the deal with this thing? Nope, it's perfect. Perfect. And it even has a little motor attached to it. Got a little trolling motor. Hook a battery up to it. I'm like, oh, I'm starting to like this idea. Uh, wait a second, I don't have to actually pedal it. Like, I can, you know, bang. I'm like, oh, this is getting gooder here. I look at it and nothing wrong with it. Okay, so I call her up and I go, hey, this thing's heavy. Can you come down here and help me lift it into the truck? Then she starts slow playing it. You know, like when you're playing poker and you got a really good hand, you don't want to throw all your chips in at once, right? You just limp in. I go, hey, will you come down and help me? She goes, oh, no, no, you know, babe, just forget it. We don't need it. It's not a big deal. Just, just leave it there. She's trying to, like, reverse psychology me. And I'm like, wait, I didn't want this thing to begin with. Now you're telling me no? So I'm like, come on, babe. And she's like, no, just forget it. I'm like, babe, get down here and help me get this thing in the truck. So she comes down. Another guy, thankfully, was passing by. He's like, you guys need some help? I'm like, you bet we do. <laughs> so we lift that thing in there, and it's golden. I'm like, oh, sweet, we got a pedal boat. But here's the thing. None of that would have happened if I would have disobeyed the Lord and got the pedal boat from Bass Pro Shops in the beginning, right? When he told me to wait, if I would have just pressed on and did it anyway, I wouldn't have got it for free. So I would have been out there on the lake with my thousand dollar boat, looking like a fool. See, and I, it didn't have a trolling motor on it, it didn't. See, now I could be out there looking like a fool, but at least I did it for free, you know what I'm saying? These I got it for free. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's right. Okay? No offense, honey. I'm just saying. Like, you got to listen to the Lord. Be prepared to do what he's telling you to do. Okay? He goes on in verse 16 to say, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. First part, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. Yet the atheist says, how could that be? How could this scripture actually be from God when men wrote it? And not just men, but uneducated men at that. They didn't go to fancy universities or anything like that. How did they write this? They only say this because they don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Number one, the scriptures. Do you know in the law of Moses, it was a commandment that the men of the Israelites would pass on the sacred writings to the next generations that they could follow it as well. It's a commandment. And so every boy would go to what they call Hebrew school. You guys should be writing this down. People are going to ask you these questions. They went to Hebrew school. And while they're at Hebrew school, guess what they learned to do? They learned to read the Torah. They learned to write. They learned to do math. They learned to do all kinds of stuff there. It was school for them. They weren't uneducated people. They knew what they were doing. This was the job of Israel, was to give the sacred scriptures of God to the rest of the world. God told Abraham, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. Not just Israel, all the nations. This was part of it. The scriptures were part of it. But they don't know the scriptures, and so they say, oh, it can't be God breathed. It can't be the inerrant word of God. But we know that they also don't know the power of God either because we've seen that God can do way more miraculous things than having a person who's uneducated write some words down on a page. Think about it though. It's pretty simple to see that it's all coherent. There's no things that go against each other. Think about even the prophecies in it. There were prophecies about Jesus that were written five, six, seven hundred years before he was ever born. These guys are writing these prophecies down, not even knowing what they were talking about. But the Holy Spirit came upon them and they just wrote it down. And we've seen that these things have been fulfilled. So how can you say that it's not given by inspiration of God? No, it's easy to see if you read it because they said what would happen half a century before it actually happened. But there's way more miraculous things than that. God took millions of people, brought them out of Egypt, made them cross through the Red Sea, where he split the water side to side, and they walked through on dry ground. Dry ground. And not only that, but then after that, the Egyptian army who was following them thought they could just go through too. The most powerful army in the world at that time thought they could just go right through. And yet the Israelites went through, all the Egyptian army was in there, and God went and put the waters back to normal, and they all drowned. Do you know that in the Gulf of Aqaba, in the Red Sea, it's bottom like this, of an ocean. It's bottom. And then all of a sudden, it comes up like this, and there's a flat porch, and then it goes back down the other side to ocean bottom again. He literally made a way for them to walk across. And you can go there today. You can scuba dive there today and go on the bottom of that porch right there, And there's coral formations of chariot wheels there. Today. You can go and see it. You can go to Sodom and Gomorrah today, and you can stick a shovel in the ground, pop that thing up, and out will will pop baseball-sized balls of sulfur. 
from where God rained down fire and brimstone and destroyed the whole place? You know, that's what sulfur is, is brimstone. That's what they called it. Sulfur. And you could take that piece of sulfur, you could stick a match underneath it, and it'll catch on fire again. The things that it says happen here aren't just make-believe. You can go see it today. They actually happened. And beyond that, I mean, we talk about prophecies. There's 3,000-ish prophecies in Scripture. 2,000 of them have already been fulfilled. 2,000. Two-thirds. That's more than coincidence, right? There's so many prophecies that have already been fulfilled. Like, how can you not see that's when, excuse me, that's when God foretold the future before it happened. That's a prophecy. He foretold the future, and 2,000 times it has already happened. We got 1,000 to go. We can trust the word of God. It's 66 different books compiled together from 40 different, well, 40 plus different authors. They don't know who wrote Hebrews. Could be plus at least 40 different authors over the span of 1,500 years. And yet it's all pointing to the same thing. It's all pointing to the same person. It's all pointing to Jesus. You can read through even the Old Testament and see that it's about him. It's a picture of him. Scripture tells us that he is the embodiment of the word. He is the word. It is who he is. John 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. How can the word be with God and be God at the same time? He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can not overcome it. It's who he is. In Matthew 5, 18, this is what Jesus said about the word of God. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. A jot and a tittle, that's the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. Not even one pen stroke will disappear from the law until all is fulfilled. Do you know, this is another thing atheists say, Man, I'm giving you lots of ammunition here today. They say, oh, the scriptures today have been corrupted. They're not the same as they were back in the day. Apparently, they haven't heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament. Do you know that they've looked at those scriptures from B.C. times and they are above 99% the same as our Bibles right now. Above 99%. You think God doesn't protect his word? You think right here where he says that nothing is going to pass away from it until all things are fulfilled, you think that's a joke? No, that's not a joke. He is the word and he will never pass away for he is eternal. It won't pass away. He's going to take everything all the way through completion. And all of us are going to be there to see it. Though all of this may seem like folly to some, the word of God is life to us. Trust in God. Trust in his word. He has given us many infallible proofs, he says. He who seeks, finds. He who knocks, the door will be open to him. Diligently seek God, and you will come to know him like nobody else does. 
Yeah. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that we can trust you and we can trust your word and we know you're taking care of it and we know it's the truth and by it we discern the lie and by it we are complete. By it we're ready for every good work, God. All these things you do in us through your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you have done that, God. And you have liberated us from the lies of the world that we get to have truth in you forevermore. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.